challenging a wide variety of circuits, pushing the limit, and sometimes beyond. They ignore the dangers of their chosen career. The great names focus on winning and ride the ragged edge. They are in a constant search for the elusive victory. In a season that has been the definition of parody, Bobby Rahal is the points leader, but he has yet to win a race. Six races run this year. Four times Rahal has finished second. Consistency and tenacity have given Rahal the edge. The ever steady Rick Mears is second in the points. This has been a strange year for the three-time PPG champion. He led the opener to Australia until a bizarre accident relegated him to third place. He hit the wall in practice in Indianapolis for the first time in 14 years of racing at the Brickyard. But then he recovered to take the pole and a fourth Indy 500 crown. The Flying Dutchman, Ari Leyendijk, holds third spot in this year's championship chase. Never afraid to straddle the fine line between success and danger, Leyendijk claimed victory at Phoenix earlier in the season. But with his team now in financial trouble, a rough path lies ahead for the Dutchman. This could be the last race of the best season of his career. The young John Andretti occupies fourth place in the points. The Australian opener was a microcosm of this season. While mishaps plagued the front runners, John Andretti was smooth. He stayed clean and clinched his first IndyCar victory in the very first race for the Hall BDS team. A week ago in Detroit, the unusual continued to prevail. Late in the fight, Mario rear-ended a safety truck, and then moments later, son Michael ran afoul of the same incident. Emerson Fittipaldi took the checkered flag, further tightening the points fight. Six races, six different winners. 200 miles ahead, another checkered flag waits. What else lies in wait on the road to victory in the Budweiser G.I. Joe's 200? Get huge savings. Shadow of the magnificent Mount Hood. It is the final day of Portland's annual Rose Festival at Portland International Raceway, right at the edge of the Columbia River. It's time for round seven of the PPG IndyCar World Series, the Budweiser GI Joe 200. And today it's brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q is one tough motor oil. By Suzuki and your Suzuki dealer who has the ride you've been waiting for and the financing to get it. And by Goodyear, the unanimous choice of every single team that races in the Kart IndyCar Series. Hello and welcome to the Great Pacific Northwest, Portland International Raceway, where it's a massive crowd here today. They expect another record, and the focus is on the IndyCars. Hi, I'm Paul Page, and this is one terrific racing circuit. It's produced some great races in the past. As a matter of fact, the closest finish in IndyCar history occurred right here at Portland. And today, well, look what predicts this race. Six races so far, six different winners. A points fight that is incredibly tight, led by Bobby Rahal, followed by Rick Mears. And there is some other significance here today. As we start this race, Mario Andretti will start his 350th IndyCar race. His son, Michael, well, he's been struggling for the weekend. In fact, he's going to start in his backup car because they broke the chassis during the qualifying runs earlier in the week. There's another man to watch here, Al Unser Jr., the defending kart champion. He's had his problems, Derek Daly, and to add to them, he comes to this race with the flu this morning. Well, that's right, and something I've been curious about, Paul, over the last couple of races is the performance, or lack thereof, of Al Unser Jr. Now, don't get me wrong here. When I think of Al Unser Jr., I think of one of the world's finest race car drivers. I expect him to be fast everywhere. But he wasn't a factor in Detroit. He wasn't a factor during practice or qualifying at Milwaukee. He wasn't really a factor at the Indianapolis 500. And one of the reasons I think for that is, last year his engineer was Alan Mertens. They had a great rapport together. Alan Mertens knew what Alan Sir Jr. needed in the car, knew what he wanted, knew what to give him. And that gives a driver great confidence. Well, Alan Mertens is also the designer of the 
the new Galmer IndyCar. He's back in England building that car. So Alonso Jr. now has a new engineer, John Dick, a man he has the utmost respect for, but it takes time to build up that critical rapport that a driver and an engineer needs to extract the maximum from each other and hence the maximum from the car. So I think now, Alonso Jr. said this weekend, he's beginning to feel that rapport for the first time, which is so necessary. We'll definitely keep an eye on Little Al. There's another great story, the front row, the Penske team. Rick Mears broke the track record and held the pole position right until the last lap when he was eclipsed by his teammate Emerson Fittipaldi, who now has the pole. Let's go to the front row and Gary Gerald. Well, Paul, Emerson Fittipaldi is right over there, right down here in the Marlboro car is Rick Mears. Rick, a quick question before this one gets underway. Everybody at Portland always concerned about fuel and fuel consumption. How much does it impact strategy, and can you really race? Well, it, it impacts it quite a bit, but you can race. That's part of the race, so the guy that figures that out the best, maybe he'll be the one home. Well, that's certainly going to play a key into the outcome of this one, Paul, as we go back now on pit road and we check in with our colleague, Jan Bikas. Thanks, Gary. As Paul mentioned at the beginning of the show, Mario Andretti is about to make history by starting his 350th IndyCar race. Mario, does it feel any different on your 350th as opposed to your first? No, I guess uh, I'm certainly used to getting into these things, so you know, it's just a, it's another race, and uh, I just hope that uh, it's a good one for us, obviously. Okay, we wish you the best of luck. Paul? All right, here at Portland, 1.9 miles around a nine-turn road course. It requires very careful balance for the race car. Here's today's tip from the cockpit and Danny Sullivan. Well, turn three and four to me has always seemed one of the more important sections on the track for, for whatever reason. Whenever I go quick through there, I get a quick lap. Um, this is a section that's a little bit funny. It's got two apexes, uh, two clipping points. You'll see the curving down there. When you come into it, you enter kind of early. Uh, you touch the early apex, the early clipping point at the curb right there, and then you hold a tighter line all the way to the second apex. Now from there, you then let the car go out. This is done in fourth gear or third gear, depending on which gearbox you have. If it's a six-speed, it's fourth gear. If it's a five-speed, it's in third gear. It's very important to carry your speed through there. There's a lot of G-forces that are generated in there, and when the car's working good, the front end stays in very nicely, and you just hang it out all the way around. In an ideal situation, when you brake, everything shifts and goes forward, and you feel kind of a dive onto the front, and that gives you a great confidence in the, the grip on the road and everything that you're stopping in a very good way. Then when you transfer back onto the throttle, it shifts and sits back down at the rear. On a modern race car, though, you don't want too much of that pitch back and forth because it upsets the balance of the car. One of the reasons that this section between three and four and five is so important is it's one of the longer sections right there to, to stay on your throttle to pick up some speed. Obviously, the most important corner is the one leading onto the longest straightaway. But I think in this section, you're on the throttle, you can make up so much time by having a very quick car around this section. Danny Sullivan will start this race from the third row. There's the points leader, Bobby Rahal, as he waits with the rest for the command to start engines. And to give it, the president of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Tony George. Gentlemen, start your engines. Emerson Fittipaldi and a look over Michael Andretti's shoulder. We're set and ready to go. 
All of the Indy cars have indicated that their engines have started and we're ready to roll out on the pace laps as we are ready for 200 miles ahead in the Budweiser G.I. Joe 200 at Portland. It should be a terrific race. Stay with us. And here at Portland, the Indy cars are rolling on the first of three laps leading up to the green flag. So let's take a look at the starting grid. The starting grid is brought to you by the Die Hard Battery. Now, with more power when you need it most. On the pole, it's Emerson Fittipaldi with a new track record. He's the 1989 winner here at Portland. Alongside is his teammate at Penske, Rick Mears. His best finish here was third. The second row on the inside is Scott Pruitt. This is his second start at Portland. And to the outside is Michael Andretti, the defending champion of this race. The third row on the inside is Al Enzer Jr., who won his very first IndyCar race here in 1984. And Danny Sullivan, the 1988 winner of this event with Alfa Romeo power. The fourth row on the inside is Mario Andretti, a back-to-back -back winner here in 1985 and 86. And Bobby Rahal, the current points leader, who won this race in 1987. The fifth row to the inside is Eddie Cheever. He has a trio of third place finishes on road courses, his best IndyCar finishes. Ari Leyendijk is to the outside. He may be driving his last IndyCar race today. The sixth row on the inside is John Andretti, who won the season opener in Australia, and Mike Groff, the former Indy Lights champion. Inside the seventh row is Scott Brayton. His best career finish of fifth came here in 1987. And Jeff Andretti, the leading candidate for Rookie of the Year honors. The inside of the eighth row is Canadian road racer Scott Goodyear and Tony Bentonhausen making his second start here at Portland. The ninth row on the inside, Ted Prappas. He scored a sixth at Long Beach and Hiro Mashusta of Japan. In the tenth row, Didier Taze, who's driving for the leader card team and the great A.J. Foyt. The 11th row on the inside is Guido Daco. A 12th in 1989 is his best IndyCar finish. And Jeff Wood, his first race here. The 12th row, the lone car of Dale Coyne, who hasn't raced here since 1988. Interestingly enough, in the first six positions, three different engines represented. Alfa Romeo, Chevrolet, and Cosworth. The weather today, well, it's partly cloudy right now, though the sun breaks through from time to time. A nice, comfortable 68 degrees. But look at the bottom line. There is a chance of rain here. The teams will definitely put that in their calculations. Now let's go to Gary Gerald. Paul, on the Penske pit, a familiar face is missing. Roger Penske not here. Only the second time in nearly 20 years that he hasn't been in the pits for one of these IndyCar races. Nigel Bennett will be on the radio to Rick Mears today. Roger has a previous business engagement, and he's missing it. And the other time that he missed an IndyCar race? When he got married back in 1973. Let's go to Jan Bikas. In the high-tech world of IndyCar racing with radio communication, they still use the traditional pit board, which is set up here on the wall, ready to go now. But just like in other professional sports where they use two types of communications and there was two people on the sidelines making the calls, they do the same thing here in IndyCar racing so you don't know which one to believe. All right, they now work their way on the second of three laps leading up to the start of this race. 104 laps around this track, 1.922 miles is the length of the track. Nine turns, six to the right and three to the left. Here are the engines in the race today. By the way, we'll be talking about Cosworth a little bit more because their development engine is very, very close to making the racetrack. Looking at the chassis in the race as well. Well, of course, Roger Penske has the front two rows, or the front row with two chassis. Lola dominates the situation here. There they are, 15 Lola cars. And of course, that lone true sports entry, the All-American car, one that Derek Daly, you're looking for a great deal out of. Really, it's a, it's a very ambitious and a major gamble for a team the size of True Sports to design and build their own car. But this car, made in America, we've seen that touted many times, is a very good car. It might be a great car. A lot of people think here, after he qualified third, that if he had as much horsepower as some of the other cars have, it might have been on the pole. Let's take a look at what this circuit here at Portland International is like. First natural terrain circuit of the year. Very tough. One you really have to figure out. The Indy cars, unlike some of the others, use a chicane down there in the middle of the straightaway to try and slow them down, or their speed into turn one would be awesome. A lot of people would like to get rid of that chicane. It has been good. It has caused problems. But basically, they still use it. They have to make, uh, make do with it. Off the final turn, 
The front row comes a line. This crowd, over 118,000, come to their feet, ready to watch the start of the Budweiser G.I. Joe's 200. And there's the green flag. And Rick Mears and Emerson Fittipaldi as they come five wide and they touch, coming down toward the chicane. And look as Andretti moves up to the front of the field and battles for the lead. Boy, surprised that they made it through on that one. My word, what an aggressive move we saw by Michael Andretti. Squeezed down the inside. Rick Mears was in his way, hit him a smack, went outside Emerson Fittipaldi. Very, very aggressive move by Michael Andretti. Michael Andretti leads the race, coming through the pack on the first turn. He is followed by Emerson Fittipaldi and then Rick Mears. But Michael, driving his backup car, he's had some trouble here. They spun the primary off the course, and the bouncing damaged the engine mounts, and they said they couldn't do anything with the backup yeah, with the primary car. So here he is in the backup car, and he's being chased by the two Penske cars as Fittipaldi closes in and uses every inch of that track. Look how he goes over those speed bumps. Every inch of the track, and as you say, the curbing. This is one of the few tracks you can drive over some of the curves here. We just saw Emerson do it. But he's in pursuit of Michael, the ever-aggressive, always-aggressive Michael Andretti. On the front stretch, Rick Mears lays back and is now accepting a challenge from Al Unser Jr. with Scott Pruitt just behind. But little Al is proving that he's in this fight, too. Little Al catching up. Oh, Scott Pruitt has a look down the inside of Little Al. See what Al did? He moved over to block the line. Defensive driving. Nice protective move by Al Jr. A little protection of the line, but look at Scott Pruitt as Scott moves right up behind Al Unser Jr.'s car. And Scott Pruitt is trying to give chase right behind them as Ari Leyendijk. Michael continues to be the leader of the race. Bobby Rahal is just behind Leyendijk as they've completed now the first lap in a race in which fuel will be absolutely critical. It has in all of the years past. And what that means is that there is just enough fuel to make it to the end. Making it to the end is important, but also finding the exact lap on which to make your fuel stop is also critically important. And Scott Pruitt, back after that terrible accident last year, in this True Sports All-American entry, the Budweiser car, Steve Horn and the True Sports team wanting to prove that there's plenty of good American technology that can build and race Indy cars as well. So that's quite a venture. On board with Ari Leyendijk. This is turn one. This is the double apex turn two and three here. I see Leyendijk dabs, dabs the power. One gear change down. Trying to follow Scott Pruitt. Trying to get close enough. Not close enough to make a pass, though. So Ari Leyendijk continues his chase of Scott Pruitt. Boy, what a start we saw. And we've got him pretty well he, as, he, as he chops the wheel there. Let's take a look at this start again, Derek. Now watch what Michael and what he does here. He moves to the right of your screen. Now look, Mears is in his way. Bang, hits Mears, moves him out of the way, and continues. Look at this move around the outside of Emerson. Outside or inside for the left for the uh, left hand part of the chicane. Boy, just shouldered his way through. At one time, I was counting eight wide on this straightaway. I don't think I've ever seen that before. There's Al Enter Jr. Little Al runs right now in fourth place, then Lion Dyke, then Pruitt, and then Bobby Rahal, the points leader. And As Lion Dyke's managed to get around Pruitt. Did make the pass on Pruitt now. Pruitt, they say, lacks a little bit of horsepower here. Now Bobby Rahal chases Scott Pruitt. This is back in section corner one, two, and three again. Rahal, you see, hear him dab the power on, off, on, off. Now he's on the brakes. Let's just listen carefully as we take this lap with Bobby Rahal. Everybody does it, so you can't gain much, but you really have to use that curve, because it is the fastest way through that very fast left-right section. The Quaker State onboard camera bringing remarkable views here from Bobby Rahal, also from Ari Leyendike, and from the leader of the race, Michael Andretti. Michael Andretti leads it. He has about a second and a half now ahead of Emerson Fittipaldi. Rick Mears runs in third, then Allenser Jr., then Ari Leyendike, Scott Pruitt, and Bobby Rahal. Right behind Ray Hall is Mario Andretti, and then Danny Sullivan, Eddie Cheever, John Andretti, and Mike Groff as we ride with the leader of the race, Michael Andretti, with a spectacular move, shoulders his way up through the front of the field 
on the very first corner, right on the green flag as they go eight abreast. And now Michael Andretti trying to overcome some terrible luck that he has had both last week and throughout the qualifying this week is in the lead of the race as he comes onto the main straightaway here at Portland International. Well, Michael Andretti is out in front. Fuel will be a critical factor. The weather may also play a part. We'll be back with more from Portland. Ray Hall, the points leader. He's never won this year. Looking desperately for a win, but still he's in a very comfortable points position. Ten ahead of second place, Rick Mears. And I'm sure he hates people constantly saying a comfortable second place or a nice conservative run because really the wins have been so close. I mean, Detroit within a couple of car lengths of winning. But Ray Hall, he knows what it's like to be successful because he's won many races in the past. But I'm sure those second places are a tremendous frustration to him. That's something that truly bothers a race driver, doesn't it? Second, despite the fact that you're gaining points, is fairly meaningless. As uh, That's Dale Coyne in the red, white, and blue car, and he pulls wide to let that battle for fourth place come by on the inside. Dale started in last place. Dale Coyne, of course, used to run Randy Lewis in this car. That deal has since folded. There's no sponsorship at all on that car. Look at Bobby Rahal. Rahal coming up right with, Sc with Scott Pruitt and doing battle. Rahal seems to be running when you consider Al's position, a rather conservative run. Is that part of the overall fuel issue here? I think it could be, particularly at this early stage in the race. But look how difficult it is to pass here. Look what happens. He goes to the apex on the left side, gets back on the power, uses all the road to the right, goes back to the left. Now watch all the apex he clips here. One, two on the left, and another one on the right-hand side. There's very, very little room to pass anyway, even if he was faster. Leader of the race, Michael Andretti, with a spectacular move on the start as he comes on to the home stretch and flashes past the pit once again. And remember, he's got one of our Quaker State onboard cameras, and this was the start. The green flag just down the course there. They acknowledge it. Now let's watch Michael. Now he's catching Emerson, so he has to make a move. He can't make it, then he makes it. Wow, just made on courage, don't you think? Whoa, he braked very, look at the corrections he made on the way into the chicane and then exiting the chicane. Absolutely on the limit of that car. Some spectacular driving. There's Emerson Fittipaldi who runs in second place. Rick Mears is third. Michael Andretti, of course, is being carefully observed by the McLaren team, doing some test sessions with him and hoping to go to Formula One next year. But of course, there's also some conversation that maybe that isn't so much a Formula One effort as a consideration of a McLaren return to IndyCar racing with Michael Andretti as the driver. Which do you think may be true, Derek? Well, anything could be possible. I spent last weekend covering the Mexican Grand Prix from Mexico City, and Gerhard Berger there feels that he will stay at McLaren next year. So there really is a couple of question marks hanging over what will happen with that Michael Andretti Formula One situation. So out in front by 2.2 seconds is Michael Andretti, but let's watch Ray Hall as he comes inside Scott Pruitt. Tries to fake him coming into the chicane, can't get it done. That gives a slight advantage to Pruitt. But Ray Hall continues in pursuit, and he's been knocking at Pruitt's back door constantly. Tried to make that move a couple of times. That car, the true sports car, is very good under braking, so it's a very difficult move to pull off. But we said earlier on, look how tight this racetrack is all through these turns here. It's almost impossible to pass, so that's Rahal's only chance. But it'll be very difficult unless Pruitt leaves the door open or makes a little mistake. Michael Andretti has reported to his team that fuel is good. And what they are doing, it's in fact a lesson that they learned with that uh, terrible loss two years ago at Milwaukee, is they report out the fuel situation every lap as they flash past the pits. And they compare that to the computations in the pits to what's on the car. And so Michael Andretti leads the race. We asked him earlier, your team this year seems to have an edge. As defending champion, how do you feel coming here to Portland? We had a good setup here last year. The car just felt you know, as good as I've ever had a car here at Portland. And uh, right now it's feeling even better than last year. And I think a lot of it is because of the weather, because it's a lot cooler, so we have a lot more grip. So, you know, hopefully we can chip away and get a couple tents here and there and maybe try to keep our edge. But it's going to be tough because, you know, you get to a wall and then it's hard to, hard to get more. And meanwhile, the other guys are catching up. And look at there, that's Scott Brayton sideways in the track as Michael Andretti just squeezes past. Looks to be about one car width. 
right behind Scott Brayton. Here's what happened just a moment ago. Scott Brayton battling with Scott Goodyear, and Brayton just got the back end loose. That's Jeff Andretti that came through as well. And wasn't able to stop the car on the grass because there isn't very much grip there. We see, oh, look at flames in the back of the car. Was not able to stop on the grass, slipped back right onto the line. A very dangerous, pre precarious situation for Brayton. Remember, those two had a... Uh, had a solid battle at Long Beach as well. That little fire is just oil in the turbocharger. It doesn't endanger anything. As long as it doesn't catch the bodywork alight. We did see, I think, the fire went out quite quickly, but that can be a potential hazard because these cars are so hot and they need that airflow constantly over the bodywork to cool it down to stop it catching fire. You also saw yellow flags, local yellows in that area, and the white flag telling them that this safety vehicle, the car safety vehicle, is out on the race course. Remember, that's important because of the situation last week with both Michael and Mario Andretti at Detroit, where Mario came around the corner, didn't know the vehicle was there, and center punched it. And then Michael came around and got involved in the situation as well. Well, a different situation this week at Portland. Michael Andretti is in front, and he remains there. 12 laps are complete. When there is an incident on the track, the drivers rely on the corner workers and their flags to keep them aware of the situation on the circuit. Here's Gon Vikas with more. On a road course like here at Portland, the SCCA turn workers and the flags that they use are in fact the eyes and the ears for the drivers. As a driver approaches the corner, if there were a problem on the course, the first flag that he would see would be the standing yellow flag as Cheryl is displaying for us now. This means caution, no passing. At the next turn station, you would in fact see a waving yellow flag, meaning that there is a problem on the course, the track could be blocked. If there were a safety vehicle at the scene, the white flag would be displayed as it is now by Dave, and if there were oil or debris on the track, the debris flag would also be shown. Bill is now also giving the third sign to show the driver which side of the track to drive to. Now all this information is wonderful, but it is the driver's responsibility to make that decision as to how much to slow down. When you're here at a place like Portland with the wide open spaces and good visibility, it makes that choice a much easier one. Of course, the other possibility would be a full course yellow, which puts the pace car out and slows the entire field down. As we continue watching a nice little battle between Mario Andretti, Eddie Cheever, Danny Sullivan, and John Andretti. That's 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th. Let's go back one week, Derek Daly. The situation at Detroit. The flagman apparently did their job. Fortunately, there was no uh, injury involved in that, but Mario Andretti came around and caught the back end of the cart vehicle safety one. How do you read it? Well, I think the key phrase from Jan Vikas was when the flag, the yellow flag is waving, the track may be blocked. That's what the driver has to be aware of. That's what Mario was not aware of, did not allow for. Consequently, we saw the incident that we saw with the safety truck. I think the drivers themselves have to be a little bit more responsible under the waving yellow flag situation. Of course, what Mario said was that he'd been through the area once, and there was a change in status of the area, and he felt that that change in status was sufficient to demand a full course yellow. So conversations have gone on. The good news is that whenever that happens, the drivers and cart get together, and they talk about it to make sure that it doesn't become a safety problem. It didn't then, and that's good news, but it did affect the outcome of the race relative to Mario and Michael Andretti. Well, Mario Andretti in his 350th IndyCar start as Bobby Rahal comes up to challenge Scott Pruitt again, moving around some traffic. Still, Rahal cannot get around Pruitt. They remain in the same position. Nothing's changed up here. The braking zone is so short in these cars that Rahal can only get a split second to try and make a move down the inside. But Pruitt's car is the equal or more than Rahal's under braking. It's a very difficult situation. We've now seen them make the attempt three clear times. Hasn't got the job done yet. 16 laps are complete. We're about halfway to the first scheduled pit stop. And where they schedule it as we continue watching Bobby Rahal's run with the Quaker State onboard camera. Well, where they schedule it is absolutely critical. They can't miss it at all. Let's look at Rahal. He continues to climb all over Scott Pruitt. Rahal looks to be a little bit faster down the straight, which is probably what we expect from the Chevrolet versus the Judd. The Chevrolet is a more developed engine. But under braking and in the corners, this True Sports made in America car is exceptionally good. 
two interesting mental attitudes here. As you see, Ray Hall closes up with the power of the Chevrolet on the jet powered car of Scott Pruitt. Scott, of course, well, he's a man with something to prove. Terrible injuries last year. He's in a comeback mode with a brand new car, a development year. Truly not expected to win, perhaps even not do well, but he's had a pretty good year thus far. Ray Hall, on the other hand, he's the man that is leading the points, but without a win. As we move a little further back in the field, there is Danny Sullivan. He has been battling with Eddie Cheever. Eddie Cheever got by a little bit ago. And just behind Danny is John Andretti, winner of the first race of the year. Let's get an update on the Scott Brayton situation from Gary Gerald. Well, Paul, we had an opportunity. As you know, he got restarted. He's back on course. We checked in with Dick Simon and the team. They say the car is loose. They want more downforce. But they're going to keep him on course and wait and try to get to that first designated pit time going to put a bigger wicker build on, put a little more downforce on the rear, try to tighten things up and perhaps handle the race course a little bit better. You're talking about getting to that prescribed first lap stop. Not much of a window. They're trying to get the lap number 33. If you don't get there, it could become a three-stop race, depending, of course, on full course yellow. Of course, if it becomes a three-stop race, then the 15 seconds or so that you spend on that third stop in the pits, while it seems to be a very short time, look at John Andretti as he kicks the back end off the track. So it seems to be a short time at the speeds they're running here. The car running against you is getting an advantage of about 110 yards every second that you're slowing down and stopping in the pits. If Scott Brayton is in as much trouble as he's in that he flies off the racetrack like that and he's about to be left. I don't see any difference with it. Whether it is a two or three stop race. I think he should go to the pits right now because he'll only be a danger to himself and everybody else on the racetrack. Carl Haas, the owner, along with Paul Newman of this car, Michael Andretti, leader of the race. Now a full 10 seconds out in front of Emerson Fittipaldi, but fuel certainly has to be a concern for that team. They'll watch it closely. We'll be back. Belgium driver Didier Tay is now a resident of Scottsdale, Arizona, had a fire at the back of his car, pulled it to a stop, one of the course marshals came out immediately to lend assistance, and Taze just decided, I'm the one with the fireproof clothing on. He took the extinguisher away and fought the fire himself. Here was that incident just a few seconds ago as he had a little bit of trouble climbing out. And, of course, the fire completely destroys these carbon monocoques that these cars are now built of. Just breaks it up, break, uh, makes it very brittle, takes all the resin out of it. So Didier Thays, in an effort to save that a very expensive car, says, here, look, come on, down here, down here. Then he says, hey, give it to me. Give it to me. I'll do it myself. Of course, he is in that uh, full driver's uniform and helmet, better equipped to handle that. Show you one of the reasons that they are so concerned. You suggested that the fire does damage the resin. Ted Prappas had a situation a couple of weeks ago at, at Detroit, or last week at Detroit. Little fire, little tap against the wall. The combination cost $73,000. Bobby Rahal now up behind Ari Leyendijk as he's managed to get around Scott Pruitt. And now challenges Leyendijk for fifth place. And did we see a drop of water? That's one of the concerns. You don't know if that's blowback from another car that got onto the camera lens on Bobby Rahal's car or a shower in this area. A shower could alter this race. And of course, Portland, well, they have a few showers here. Anything could happen here, and you're right, it could alter the race. The biggest thing it will alter, of course, is throws all the fuel calculations out the window because you, you run so much slower in the rain, you don't use the fuel that's allotted. You can really run as hard as you like, and if it dries out, of course, you have no fuel uh, worries whatsoever. Run you through the entire field after 20 laps. 23 are now actually into the record book, and Michael Andretti has led from the chicane. Getting past both Rick Mears and Emerson Fittipaldi as Rahal continues to fight with Lion Dyke. Let's take a look at where Bobby Rahal took a little chop running through that chicane earlier. Watch Rahal, the yellow and blue car. Lion Dyke goes underneath, and now Rahal would like to come through, but look, Jeff, oh, Jeff Andretti takes the line. Rahal thought he was going to get through. Rahal takes avoiding action, drives over the curb on the right-hand side, thought he was going to get enough room to get through, but I tell you, that shows you how fast things happen and how careful you have to be. Also a demonstration of how good Bobby Rahal is because he anticipated that situation. And while he was, oh, he almost loses the back end there. A little tenacity out of Rahal. 
So Bobby Rahal, who is number one in the points, hasn't won a race yet this year. We ask him, do you have a timetable now for the rest of the kart season? I think you have to take things really one race at a time. Uh, give your best on that weekend and, and uh, see where you end up. And, uh, um, you know, maybe only till the end of the season, let's say where you had a 30 or 40 point lead with two or three races to go, where then the key becomes scoring points, you know, finishing the races, not you know, where you don't necessarily have to go out and win it, where you can have a fourth or a fifth, uh, just so that you keep that that spread or you've got something to work with. You know, as I say, maybe at that point you can you can sort of uh, strategize, like you say. But uh, up until then, I think you've got to take it one day at a time. Bobby Rahal taking it one car at a time as well as he finally comes out of seventh place and moves up to sixth place getting around Scott Pruitt. Now, what about the fuel situation here? It is very critical. What about the Penske team? Here's an update from Gary Gerald. Oh, that fuel issue is on everybody's mind. It's been there all day long, even though we're early in the race. Huddled conferences here near the telemetry that monitors the amount of fuel being consumed on Emerson Fittipaldi's car. They are saying that they're on target, but the key here is they've already got Emerson short shifting, trying to keep the revs down, trying to conserve fuel early, trying to get to lap 33 for the first stop. Let's go to Jan Bikas. Down here in the Andretti pit, they say fuel so far is not a problem. Behind me on the pit board, they just gave Michael the OK, meaning he's OK on fuel. They're planning for having him coming in on lap 34. Well, lap 34 would be absolutely ideal. And by the way, for those of you who may not know Jan Bikas, we're glad to have him on the telecast. The former Indy Lights champion who's had more than his share of time behind an IndyCar wheel and a driver instructor. So. We'll get a lot of good information out of him. Michael still leads. Back at Portland International Raceway with the Indy cars. You look at Bobby Rahal. He runs right now in sixth place. After 25 laps, there was a situation. Michael Andretti was the leader all the way. And we've only had local caution flags, no full course. And we're approaching very rapidly in about six laps the time for the first stops. But as Gary Gerald reported, Emerson Fittipaldi, there comes Ray Hall alongside of uh, Ted Prappas as he continues to work on Ari Leyendijk. Emerson Fittipaldi was told to short shift. Also, Rick Mears has been told to do so, and it's really hard to believe that Michael has set the pace that he has. He's averaging 116 and a half miles an hour. Well, if he would remain on that is a race record by about six miles an hour. He's been very careful of the traffic, but boy, is he flying. As you take a look from the Quaker State onboard camera, there's Carl Haas. Remember, it takes fuel to make power. So Michael Andretti is out there leading the race. The Penske cars, they can adjust the mixture of their car, of the engine inside the car. They can turn it down lean. Look at Rahal trying to get by uh, Leyendite. They can make it leaner, uses less fuel, or they can turn it up to make more power, but uses more fuel. They have a dilemma. Mike is getting away, but they can't afford to use the fuel. This battle for fifth continues to be the best one on the racetrack, the only one at the time being. Gary Gerald, you have an update. Paul, it's just another footnote to this intriguing situation. At the Penske end of the pits, and it's a long way from where the Andretti's are, they are wondering and skeptically saying they don't see how Michael can continue this kind of a pace, even though the report we're getting from Michael's pit is they think they're okay and on target with fuel. So there are already some uh, opposing opinions at respective parts of the pit here as we await this first stop. Well, I kind of share their opinion. I mean, he's setting a really incredible pace. What do you think, Derek? Well, we've seen problems before. Computers tell lies. Telemetry don't always tell the story. Michael is the very one who lost a race here not too long ago on a Father's Day when he ran out of fuel. It's a risky business, but they're telling him how fast to go. He's still pulling away. That was the closest finish in history, and Michael, on the final turn, suddenly began to chug. His father was right behind him and just nipped him at the line. As a matter of fact, that year they moved the starting line just a few feet down. You can still see the remnants of two lines down there. And if they had used the old line, then Michael would have won the thing. Ray Hall and Lion Dyke continue to battle. And Eddie Cheever is now beginning to come into our picture, clawing his way up behind Bobby Ray Hall. No, no, that was Scott Pruitt. Eddie Cheever is sitting uh, just behind Pruitt. And there's the Pruitt car. 
picture, of course, is of Eddie Cheever, 10 years in the Formula One, now having a great time in the Indy cars. And there's Scott Pruitt now closing in on the back of Bobby Rahal. This is where Rahal makes up some time on Lion Dyke. We watched from the, the, uh, the rear view cam earlier on. Look, he closes up under braking. Look at Lion Dyke. Bob and weave as he turns to that left hander. We were talking about Lion Dyke and his situation. The announcement was made here that uh, Bob Tezak, one of the partners, does not have uh, sufficient funds to continue the season unless they can get a major sponsor. And they've said unless a major sponsor comes in, this will be the last race. Danny Sullivan, a display of smoke at the back of his Alfa Romeo car, and that looks serious. For sure, that is the end of the day. There's never that much smoke without some major, major problem. So although Sullivan still sits in the car, it's a matter of time. His day is over. Yeah, there the steering wheel gets thrown out in disgust, I think. Pat Patrick in the yellow sweater watching just behind the pits. In his 25th year of racing in the Indy cars, steps down off uh, his little stand for watching and turns his back on the car. Every week, they send a new engine over from Italy. Every week, they try something new. And their answer seems to be, well, it's working on the dyno. And Pat Patrick and Jim McGee and Danny Sullivan say the dyno is just not the racetrack. The dyno is not the racetrack. It does not allow for... Danny Sullivan trying to explain it. He gets out and talks to his people here. The dyno does not simulate on-off throttle situations like you can in a race car. It doesn't jump on the brakes like a race car does. It doesn't cause G-forces, which causes the oil to move around in the engine like a race car does. So although it may be successful on the dyno, the only place and the only thing that doesn't tell lies is the performance on the racetrack. I think they're learning that. Look at Ray Hall handle this car as we look back from Ari Leyendijk and the steam and smoke and vapor from Danny Sullivan's car drifts all down the main straightaway. You'll see it when they come around to the front side of this circuit. Bobby Rahal, that looked like he's being a little careful with the shifting, too. Oh, but he's getting closer here. He's going to be right up behind Lion Dyke this time. He's in place. He tries to the corner. He's coming to the inside. But no, nope. Lion Dyke uses all of the curve there and continues to hold him off. And Scott Pruitt is right there. He can make a move at any second, too. I think Rahal's car is definitely... Oh, Pruitt peels off into the pits. He is our first legitimate pit stop because we saw Sullivan earlier on because of a problem. But Pruitt in for fuel. So, Scott Pruitt, what should be a routine stop, and it comes on the 32nd lap. So they're pretty much on their game plan. Tire change all the way around, and they don't make any moves for any aerodynamic changes just yet. So they seem to be fairly satisfied, and, and that would mirror what we see, what we've seen out there. It seems to be simply power that is Scott's problem, as now he accelerates away from the True Sports team. Nice little pit stop for them. They wait now for Rick Mears down at the Penske pit, all the way down at the far end of the pits, and they wait for Michael Andretti as well. So now the game plans follow. 33 laps are complete. Rick Mears has already started down the pit lane. Here's Gary. And we look and now see the nose of the Marlboro Colors. Rick Mears comes in. The fueling hose is engaged along with the vent. Richard Buck and the crew go to work. Fresh rubber all the way around. Mears adjusts the visor. No changes at the front wings yet. Now the hoses come back. They'd like the balance on the car. Off the jacks. Rolling. Pretty respectable stop for the Penske team. Roger Penske not here, but he would be pleased. Fittipaldi will be in on the next lap. 15.1 seconds for Rick. Eddie Cheever makes his stop for the Ganassi team. He came out of fifth place when he rolled into the pits. And a little further down, we watch for this car. Michael Andretti. Here's Jan Bikas. Michael Andretti brings the Kmart car to a stop. Michael now is the only driver to have led every race this year. The routine here is to get the tires changed before the fuel is done. Look for the tire guys. They're done. They're waiting now just for fuel. As soon as the fuel is done, it'll be off the jacks, and Michael is out of here. Down to you, Gary. And Emerson Fittipaldi is now in on target. The jacks already up, and again, Rick Reinemann and the other Penske team in action. And wow! Andretti just went flying by us on pit road. That speed had to be up at 120 or more miles an hour easily. Fittipaldi is now rolling. This is another solid stop. Tony Bittenhausen flies by him. A lot of activity on pit road. Of course, Michael Andretti had the full length almost of the main straightaway to bring it up to speed as Fittipaldi cycles into the traffic just ahead of John Andretti. 
Kart did an interesting thing here. They've done it at a couple other races this year. They established an 80 mile an hour speed limit during qualifying and practice, and they put up big radar guns. Here is, uh, here's an idea of Michael coming out of the pits as Allenser Jr. threats in. Of course, you're a little foreshortened by the camera angle here, but boy, look how fast he comes up to speed, Derek. The problem is, although you say 80 miles an hour, race cars do not have speedometers. So what do you do? Do you guess how 85 miles an hour, how fast it is? Remember also, in a green track situation, the pit lane is the racetrack, so you're paid to race. I'm not sure you can control speed. And of course, the speed limit is not in effect during the race itself, something they only experimented with during practice. So the first set of stops are complete. We'll be back. Well, with everybody that matters for the moment at least having made their stop, yeah, we've got everybody down the order. Michael Andretti is back at the front of the field, followed by Emerson Fittipaldi, but in the stop, little Al caught an advantage moving up into third place. Rick Mears is fourth, Bobby Rahal fifth, Mario Andretti sixth, and Ari Leyendijk running just behind Mario Andretti. Gary Gerald has an update for us now. Yeah, Paul, we're walking along, and now Danny Sullivan getting back closer to the trailer where he can get away from the crowd, and out early, never fun. What happened? Well, like you said, when you're out this early, no fun, but the, I guess the engine, something in there just let go. Uh, right coming through the last corner, just went off song, looked in the mirror, there was smoke, dove right off into the pits. So we didn't cause any problems, but it was a great race out there. I mean, everybody was having a go, and, uh, you know, we suffered a little bit. We were a little down on power early on, and, and but, you know, we were holding our own, just wanted to be there at the end, and uh, I don't think we were going to catch Michael, but I don't know how many people can run that pace all day long either. Can he, can he last in the fuel situation at that pace? Well, I just saw him come out of the pit, so I don't know which lap he led. The, the thing what Michael does a lot is he tries to get that big lead and then backpedal and then just cruise it, and it's a good strategy if you can do it. Uh, but it depends on if everybody picks up the pace. And I remember a couple of years ago at Elkhart Lake, you did that, you got a victory, Michael ran out of fuel. That's right, and he reversed it a little bit last year. But, uh, you know, I don't know what's going on in there, what kind of fuel mileage are getting, what he's really doing. His car might be working that good. We'll see you in a couple of weeks in Cleveland. Okay, look forward to it. Thank Paul? You. Danny Sullivan, by the way, is hoping at the end of this week to be in Norfolk, Virginia. Remember that he spent a bit of time on the nuclear aircraft carrier, the Theodore Roosevelt. They are one of the last ships to return from Operation Desert Storm, and they'll return to Norfolk on Friday, the 28th. And a number of the IndyCar drivers hoping to be there. The ship's kind of adopted the IndyCar drivers. We watch Scott. Pruitt, and there is A.J. Foyt, who came out of the pits fairly slow, and yeah, he's coming back up. He was in the pits for a little bit of time. Derek, one of the things that has been the center of conversation here at Portland this weekend was first brought up right after the Indianapolis 500, but has been in discussion for a very long time. Apparently, an announcement was made by Balestre of the uh, FISA while at the Lamar race that it was a done deal. There were going to be 3.5 liter methanol fueled normally aspirated engines for the indianapolis 500 and several other international races beginning in 1993 that was immediately denied the united states auto club over the signature of dick king the president of usac put out a release and said while that has been suggested tony george has talked about it but it's not a decision that has in fact been made they're continuing to look at it but what it did do was stimulate more and more conversation is it a good idea is it a bad idea one of the arguments is it would bring more manufacturers into the sport an argument against it is the engine isn't designed to run on methanol or to last a long time you can't unplug a gasoline powered 3.5 and stick it in and make it a methanol there are problems on both sides how do you view the issue well, you're right. A lot of people thought it would be a good idea because the 3.5 liter engines are available. They have been built because they do use them in Formula One. But you're right. It's not a case of just uh, turning it over to a methanol engine. Nigel Mansell was very pointed in his remarks recently when he said there is no way an engine like we use can go 500 miles. So they will have to change it quite dramatically. But let me just give you a couple of numbers. If you buy an IndyCar engine, an approximate price is $100,000. A uh, V10 Judd Formula One engine, the 3.5 liter normally aspirated, is 100,000 pounds. Now, you know, given the exchange rate, it's actually probably double the price. It only lasts half as long, so although it has been suggested, I think it will take a lot of study before they can make a constructive and clever and wise decision whether to adopt such an engine formula or not.
one of the things I heard out of engineers like Nigel Bennett of Penske was leave the rules alone. As long as you do, everything gets closer and closer together. Well, we asked some of the guys that would have to deal with it, three drivers, Michael and Mario Andretti and Rick Mears, about their reaction to the possibility, not the reality, of a 3.5 liter engine at Indianapolis. I'll believe it when Tony George announces it officially. Um, there's a lot of talk, and uh, I think I support the idea. Uh, I'm not sure if I support it for 93, maybe more for 94, but um, I think uh, for the long term, you know, the year 2000, I think IndyCars need to do something as drastic as this. Um, it may hurt IndyCar racing, you know, in the, in the near future, but I think uh, uh, it's only going to be a temporary thing, and uh, if we can get more manufacturers involved and, and get more money into the series, I think it'll be, in the end, better for everybody. I think it's going to be a tough sell, but I think it's worth trying to sell. I really do. Personally, I think it's worth trying to sell. I mean, let's face it, uh, we, we have to look at not just next year, the year after. We're going into the 21st century, in a sense, with this formula. I would suspect that uh, based on the success that we've seen so far in Group C and, uh, and Formula One and the amount of manufacturers involved, it's got to be, you know, the light has to go on, you know, it, there's got to be something that tells you maybe that's the way to go. To me, my reservation is I think we're as competitive now as we've ever been. Uh, we have more cars capable of winning races than I've ever seen in the history that I've been here in, in IndyCar racing in 14 years. And uh, I know I'm having to scratch harder for every point than I ever have. So I don't see how we can make it a lot better. I think the, the key to it being the way it is today, today is the fact that the rules haven't changed. That's the secret. And that's let, allowed everybody to catch up. As soon as you start changing, then the teams that can respond the fastest will have the gain and the advantage, and that'll split up the, uh, you know, the numbers again. And they won't be as competitive unless you leave it again for a long period of time. So I think that's one of the secrets. Well, you can't dispute the fact that it is a fairly competitive season. And there's a couple of opinions. You can think of what yours may be as well. What I like about 3.5 liter engines is a glorious sound from the V10s and V12. So if they go 3.5 liter, don't stipulate it has to be a V8. <laughs> Glorious sound, which may be one of the problems. Some of the street races might have a problem with that. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. Oh, we're in the uh, Craco, or Gallus Craco. I just want to turn those around. It's correctly Gallus Craco pit. There's concern here from the part of Rick Gallus about his driver, Alan Sir Jr., the defending IndyCar champion of 1990. Not feeling well at all today. Got flu-like symptoms. We asked Rick how he's doing. He says, well, I think he's doing a heck of a job at this point. They're not that concerned about fuel. And meanwhile, his teammate, Ray Hall, for the first time, we've got a positive note on fuel. Barry, Rich, uh, Barry Green said, we may richen it up just a little bit, meaning they can get more fuel to the engine, and maybe that motor will run a little more efficiency, efficiently for Bobby Ray Hall. Well, the air temperature in the 70s, nice, dense, heavy, moist air here, may in fact be helping the fuel situation for all of these cars. Out in front, it is Michael Andretti, who is reporting his fuel situation is excellent. Andretti in traffic now, trying to overcome and lap Scott Pruitt just ahead. Coming, oh, look at that, look at that. Michael Andretti locked him up completely behind Scott Pruitt. Stayed it on the course and got it back, and now he continues to chase Pruitt. Let's get an update on another situation. Here's Gary Gerald. Paul, you talked earlier about the situation that Ari Leyendijk and the team are facing, the possibility of uh, no sponsorship. Bob Tezak is a key principal in this uh, scenario. Bob, what's going to happen with this racing operation after this event in Portland? Well, we're, we're uh, without a major sponsor, which makes it very difficult to uh, keep on competing and uh, having to fund the effort out of uh, personal funds. And we're hoping that uh, sponsorship uh, comes forth here. Uh, we have a couple things going. Nothing, uh, nothing uh, hard yet, but uh, we continue to work and uh, going to struggle and uh, and go as long as we can. Uh, but it's, uh, when you bought out Doug Shearson, I know that you didn't expect this. Is, has there been something unfortunate that's happened here that's resulted in this situation that maybe we're not aware of? Well, there was a couple sponsors that had uh, committed and then fell through. And, uh, and another uh, it's uh, it's really a shame to be doing what we're doing and running as well and uh, right in the thick of the point battle and to be without a major sponsor and 
uh, it's a lack of corporate sponsorship. We we need a we very very bad need of a sponsor to uh, to finish the season, and I and I hope uh, we can pull it off. I think we might be able to, and uh, go on to win the uh, car championship. Thank you, Bob. Let's go back to the booth and Paul Page. Well, as you listen to Bob Tizak, you ride with the seventh place car, Ari Leyendijk. Of course, he has opinions as well. And yesterday, we had a chance to sit down with Ari and ask him about this situation. Best year of his career. What about his team folding, possibly, after this race? Well, it's a possibility that it might be all over for the team because uh, the sponsors that we had, RCA and CNG, were really sponsors just for Indianapolis. And they also happened to be sponsors that were Vince Bernatelli's sponsors in the past. And CNG was brought in by, by Andy Bernatelli. So basically, Doug Shearson Racing, uh, who, whom I'm contracted with, uh, did not have a major sponsor for 1991. And, uh, you know, we went into the season knowing that it could become a problem, and it's time right now that it is a problem, and it's really unfortunate because we're having a pretty good season. Boy, what a, what a major opportunity for somebody, though. They'd be on a car that's right in the middle of the points fight. And he said... Uh, a pretty busy afternoon he's having because we saw a nice oversteer correction there but you know i feel for ari because from a driver's point of view to have an unstable uh team behind you it's very distracting and to really perform to your best you need everything going your way you need all the confidence you can get and a distraction like that like what's going on with line like team at the moment is very bad for a driver's morale Michael Andretti in this Quaker State onboard camera is still trying to handle up Scott Pruitt, who lies just ahead there. That's slowing him down just a little bit, but still a record pace of 115.08 miles an hour. Let's go down to Jan Bikas. Here in the Andretti pit, they're watching fuel very closely. Right here, you'll see on the laptop computer, what they're doing is monitoring the fuel every time the car goes by. I peeked over his shoulder, and they have a schedule and an actual, and right now, they're right on schedule kind of kind of laps that he's turning here and the record pace he's setting that's hard to believe would, would you figure that air density because it is cool and fairly human here that that makes a difference it does make a difference but another thing that makes a huge difference is the car setup sometimes you have a lot of wing on to make the car have some grip it uses fuel drag uses up horsepower but if the car is mechanically well set up if it goes through the corners with the springs and the bar set properly you don't use as much wing you don't have as much drag you don't use as much fuel so we don't know the type of setup that michael has as they come onto the front stretch rick mears has opened up a fight for third place with Allenzer Jr. Currently the number one car, Allenzer Jr. runs in third, but Rick Mir is closing right down behind him and beginning to do battle. Remember little Al, not feeling well this morning, has a touch of the flu. There's the Penske organization, that that oversees Rick Mir's car, as they monitor his fuel situation. Next stop should come about oh, lap 67, I would think, if they want to do it right. 104 laps the scheduled distance here. And everybody's still calculating back there. Michael Andretti is still out in front. Emerson Fittipaldi is second. In third place, it is Al Unser Jr. Fourth place is Rick Mears, and Bobby Rahal runs in fifth place. 50 laps are now complete. So what about the situation relative to fuel management and how you keep track of this entire race? As Scott Pruitt still holds up Michael, let's take a look at this track fact. This track fact is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q is one top motor oil. Here's Gary Gerald. Fuel consumption is always a major concern on any road course or street circuit. And while many of the teams have telemetry that tells the engineers back in the pit area how much fuel is being used, there's only a couple of things that the driver can do here in the cockpit to try to conserve fuel. Now, let's pop the steering wheel off of the post here in Scotty Brayton's car. You see this little lever right here? This is where they trim fuel. And by turning this, every time you turn it, a driver can either richen or lean the amount of fuel that goes to the engine by two or three percent. 
Now, when we say richen, we mean put more fuel into the engine. We say lean it down, we're depriving the engine of some of the fuel. Now, if 100% is optimum, you can lean it down to about 90%, but then you're gonna get in trouble because temperatures will come up and you're in jeopardy of damaging the engine. Now, the other thing the driver can do in the cockpit, down here, he can short shift. This is the shifting mechanism. When we say short shift, we mean shift early. This shows him his RPMs, revolutions per minute. If normally he would run it up on the throttle until he got 12,000 RPMs, by short shifting or shifting early, he'd shift here at, say, 11,000 RPMs. And every time he shifts, he does this, he can conserve a considerable amount of fuel. Key thing to keep in mind, fuel, of course, is power. But power is fuel, and you get only a prescribed amount of fuel at any racetrack, and you've got to make every bit count so you can finish the race. Brett Bulldog. Back at Portland, the Budweiser G.I. Joe's 200, and Michael Andretti is having a lot of trouble getting around Scott Pruitt. Now, part of the reason is Scott is involved in a battle with Eddie Cheever himself, and it's a battle for ninth place. But, boy, here's one very angry Michael Andretti. Let's go to Jan Bikas. Well, they're also very angry down here in Michael Andretti's pit. They've been on the radio to Cart saying, give Scott Pruitt the move-over flag, and in fact, Cart is waving it as much as they can. Now, in Scott Pruitt's defense, I'm sure Derek can comment on that, is that when you're about to go a lap down, that's when you really have to fight. It doesn't matter what position you're in, you gotta keep from going a lap down. Yeah, but I think you can continue that fight if you're fast enough, but Pruitt is not fast enough. He's holding up the race leader. There's no excuse for that. All he has to do is breathe the power a little bit right here. But have a look at this. Michael is so close behind him. Look at this. Look, look. Right up behind Pruitt. Waves his fist, does everything he can. Pruitt needs to let him by. Albert Pruitt, of course, is in a battle with that car just in front of him. That's the number eight car of Eddie Cheever. They're averaging 115.4 miles an hour, so it's a fairly good pace. Carl Haas still keeping track. Many of the course marshals here, by the way, are from the SCCA's Oregon region. And they've done a fine job most of the weekend. Part of it, very rainy and very cold here. As we take a look at our Pioneer Race recap after 50 laps of the race, the dominant factor here, though now he's trying to handle up Scott Pruitt and Eddie Cheever. We've said so many times, catching somebody is one thing, making the pass is so much more difficult. Now we know Michael is so much faster than these cars because he's trying to put a lap on them, yet he can't get close enough to make that move. And there you see the distance between Michael and Emerson Fittipaldi in that red and white five car. Fittipaldi, because of this, is closing in. He has come from just a just a bit over 3.9 seconds now to 2.8 seconds behind Michael Andretti. So Fittipaldi is very definitely on the charge. A good Fittipaldi story for you. Remember last week he won at Detroit. Well, when he was at Milwaukee, he had a lot of trouble with the car. And on the radio, he's reporting all this trouble to the crew. And finally, he said, this car is diabolic. Well, the crew after the race went to the dictionary to make sure they understood it. And he said, well, if this car is devil-possessed, let's have an exorcism. And that's exactly what they did. When they got to Detroit, the crew all each pulled out a spark plug from the engine, went through it in the Detroit River. He won the race. Now we're back to watching Michael Andretti. He tries to get inside Pruitt, and Pruitt runs him off onto the curb, and he makes it pass. Michael makes it pass. So now he's finally unlimbered from Scott Pruitt. He takes a look in the mirror. Boy, he wasn't happy with that one. Now he's got Cheever lying just ahead of him. Remember, he's the leader of the race, threading his way up through the pack. That's Tony Bettenhaus in the number 16 car, now just in front of Michael. My word, there is no reason why the leader of a race should have to make such a dangerous maneuver trying to lap a car that he's followed so many times. I'm sorry, but Scott Pruitt should have given the race leader a lot more room a lot earlier because he Emerson has absolutely eaten away at Michael's lead. But you see here at the same time what has happened to the battle between Scott Pruitt and Eddie Cheever. That's separated. Here is Emerson Fittipaldi, the number five car, now closing down on Pruitt and trying to catch the leader of the race, and he continues to close. He's now down to 2.2 seconds behind Michael Andretti. Well, I'll tell you now, if you were on Michael's radio, you'd hear a lot more than diabolic. Whoa. Look at, look at Fittipaldi as he works to the outside of Bettenhausen. and Bettenhaus and lets him pass. Now he has the Pruitt situation lying just ahead of him. And you know what will happen now? I bet Emerson will get past in about two laps. Well, Pruitt is no longer involved in a fight. Certainly knows that Emerson Fittipaldi is sitting right there. 
Because he closes down, let's go back, take a look at the situation where Scott Pruitt and Michael finally resolved their battle. This is on board the Quaker State on board cam. Yanked it down a gear, brought it up over the curb. Pretty gutsy move for Michael. Pretty gutsy move and something that you don't always get away with. And that's why I said there is no reason why he should have to make such an aggressive and dangerous move when he's leading the race, lapping somebody. But of course, the uh, situation is that uh, Michael still has some other traffic to deal with. Fittipaldi, his battle is broken off for the moment. But later tonight, here on ESPN, Major League Baseball, California at Detroit. Coverage begins live at 8 o'clock Eastern. Stay with us on your Total Sports Network ESPN. Michael Andretti still leading this race. He's never given up a lap as he completes the 60th lap. And Fittipaldi falls a little further backwards as he tries to handle up the traffic. Now Fittipaldi is 4.2 seconds back. And Michael Andretti has, for the most part, a clear course that rides just ahead of him. So Michael Andretti out in front. We'll be back. Still Michael Andretti out in front. Rick Mears is battling with Al Unser Jr. for third place. Emerson Fittipaldi still sits in second. Only three cars reported out of this race thus far. You saw Danny Sullivan's engine failure, and Didier Taze had a little oil fire from an oil leak. Dale Coyne went out with a bad clutch. Everybody else that started is still running in the competition here, and we are coming up very close now on the second round of pit stops. And that will help tell the tale as to whether or not Michael Andretti has in fact been running nice and rich and with plenty of fuel, or whether or not he faces a third pit stop and possibly not even make it to the end of the race. Rick Mears gonna take a shot at Al Unser Jr. as they come into the chicane. Drops out, lets little Al know that he's there, but he stays right on top of him. A little smoother run coming into the corner. They've got traffic line just ahead. And little Al handles Tony Bentonhausen well, and that puts Rick Beers back. Now, let's go down to the pit area. Further update, here is Jan Bikas. Well, when the cars are running this close together, Paul, now is when the tear-offs come into play. We've got Eddie Sheever's helmet here. What you do is you take your right hand, you grab a hold of this ring and just rip. It takes quite a tug to do it. These little strips of tape keep the next tear away held down in the airstream. Now, this is a lot of work to get these helmets ready, but what happens is the drivers use these actually to get over that little bit of nervousness and butterflies before the race. Paul? Well, Al Unser Jr. works his way down inside A.J. Foyt as Rick Mears tries to take Al Unser Jr. in this continuing fight now for third place. Little Al comes onto the pit straight. Rick Mears is right there. Two Chevrolet-powered machines. There's Bentonhausen and Foyt. They have a little side-by-side -side battle going right behind the battle for third place. And traffic can be such a guessing game because ideally what you want to do, you want to sneak by the traffic just before you enter the corner so the guy behind you will get blocked by the lapped car. So it's very much a guessing game and trying to anticipate how you can make life more difficult for the guy you're racing, the guy that's behind you. Bobby Rahal just getting past. On board there for just a moment. Fight for third continues. Little Al. Not feeling well is still having a fairly spectacular ride, but now watch at the dart and the movement in Rick Mears' car as he tries to get around the junior hunter. We mentioned in the opening of it, Al Jr. changing the engineers and how difficult that situation is to overcome because of this necessary rapport. I said, well, if you had the ideal situation, what would you like? He said, the ideal situation is happening. My engineer from last year is building me a new car that I hope will give me an advantage. On board the Quaker State camera, Bobby Rahal. Rahal runs in fifth place, trying to catch up to Rick Mears. Got a little way to go, but maybe in the next corner he'll have all the traffic cleared in front of him as he comes around Jeff Wood and Tony Bentonhouse. And Wood, of course, replacing Mark Dismore, who's still recovering from his accident in practice at Indianapolis, and we certainly wish him well on his recovery. Bobby Rahal, clear course just ahead. Right in car camera stuff. Look at the helmet strap Ray Hall uses. That's to counteract the G-forces. And to think that you get G-forces this high in a road course really says something about the grip these cars generate. Fittipaldi has finally closed up and now sits just behind Scott Pruitt. And we'll see if he can get past. But Scott Pruitt sits just behind Eddie Cheever. So that battle for ninth place has rejoined itself between Cheever and Scott Pruitt. And Fittipaldi will have to deal with it. Mike Roth sitting right there in the middle of that. Emerson Fittipaldi, the number five car. He started this season very, very slowly. 
but he's beginning to pick up momentum with his victory last week. We ask him on his feelings about not finishing in the races at Australia and Long Beach. Mainly uh, that our performance in Australia and Long Beach was not what we expect uh, from the Marlboro Penske team, and, but now, uh, before Detroit already made a big improvement on the cars, and uh, I'm really looking for for the, the next road circuit. And we should be very competitive in any of the road circuit. But again, the championship is showing as more competitive than ever. I mean, has been one winner on every race. That shows, you know, how many good drivers and how many good cars are available on the, on the championship now. Well, Fittipaldi moves around Mike Graff and very rapidly will find himself in the very same position that Michael Andretti did in Michael's pits. They prepare to refuel the car as we are now completing the 67th lap and are due for stops at just any time if they run on the game plan. This is definitely the battle on the racetrack here. A very interesting thing with Rick Mears driving style. When drivers come to road courses, it's a normal thing that they use right foot braking, but Rick Mears and I'll get into that later. So Rick Mears chases Allenser Jr. Michael Andretti is still the leader. He's being chased by Emerson Fittipaldi and Allenser Jr. Back at Portland International Raceway on board Ari Leyendike. As he comes down the pit lane and the pit stop session should be open now. A number of the crews are laid out ready to go into action and here is Michael Andretti the leader of the race as he comes in for his stop Rick Mears and Emerson Fittipaldi both chasing this car in Michael Andretti no change to aerodynamics full load of fuel here comes Fittipaldi and his boy he slams it to a stop that's what he tries to line his car up on because that's the center line of the pits which gives the fueler exactly the right length of and there goes Michael Michael goes by Fittipaldi and back into the lead of the race and they check the fuel. Some of that valuable fuel right there. Here comes Bobby Rahal as he rolls into the pits and makes a routine stop as well. He was running in fourth place. So stops, no full caution yellow at any time during this race. And so they have now been forced to make the first and now the second stop under the green flag. And boy, that's when the pit crews shine. I haven't seen a mistake today. They have been spectacular. So what interests me, Derek Daly, is I haven't seen any changes to any of the aerodynamics. Well, that's right. That's a measure of how well these cars are set up because usually you see them adjust the front wing. That's the most common thing to adjust. Nobody has adjusted anything. These cars must be handling well on the racetrack. John Andretti makes his stop as Uncle Mario Andretti rolls out from the Newman Haas pits. This is one of the most nerve-wracking times during a race when you come into the pits because suddenly you give everything over to your crew. You just hope and pray that you stop the car at the right time, that you exit the pits without stalling the car. We've seen it so many times. An incredibly nerve-wracking time during of the race. Let's go down to the pits now. Gary Gerald. Well, during that flurry of pit stops, Rick Mears came in behind Fittipaldi. He started to leave. He stalled the engine, had to push him back. He was here a long time. It's something that you hardly ever see happen to Rick Mears. When he left, I want you to look at the rubber that he left on pit road. I have never seen Rick Mears light up tires the way he did in his frustration to get back on this circuit. Let's go to Jan Bikas. Down here in the Andretti pit, what they have just finished doing is taking the clear hose, lifting it up, and putting the fuel that did not make it into the car back into the tank. It's about less, I would say, than one gallon. In other words, it only took about two feet in that clear plastic hose. It's the only bit of methanol fuel that's left here in the Andretti pit. Paul? Well, Michael Andretti is in front, being chased by Fittipaldi, but Fittipaldi is a full 11 seconds back. This is the fourth place car. That's Al Anser Jr. In the stop, Bobby Rahal got past his teammate and now runs in third place. Rahal sits just ahead. So a battle within the Gallus Craco organization developing right now, that yellow and blue car, that of course is Bobby Rahal with little Al just behind him. And Rick Mears sits some distance back behind this battle and Mario Andretti behind him running in fifth and sixth place respectively. We were watching that uh, caution that they exercised in the Newman Haas pit with the fuel 
very careful. You don't want to lose a drop of it. If he should have to come in just toward the end, that could make the difference right there. For that, for that last little splash. But let's go back and take a look at Rick Mears and um, have a look at what happened to him when he exited the pit lane. Rick Mears, a lengthy stop, killing the engine. Whoa! Bury that throttle, Rick. That's what we like. A nice dragster start. Light up those tires. <laughs> Warm up those babies with that. As the rocket came back into action. Quicker stayed on board camera with Ari Leyendijk's car. Is this the last ride for this car? Let's hope not. Leyendijk having a terrific year right now, though he runs in seventh place. And he's back just a bit from Mario Andretti, about five seconds behind Mario. So Michael is out in front, and there's Hiro Mashusta out of the Simon team as he comes back into the action, making his last stop of the day. Now that they have made him when they have, essentially lap 33, 34, and again about 67, that should make it a two-stop race, and they should go to the distance now. They should, and hopefully they can, but one comment I'd like to make. Bobby Rahal had a lot of trouble passing Leyendijk on the racetrack. His crew did an excellent job because he jumped past Leyendijk. That's on Jeff the first Wood pit in the pit stop. Pits. Jeff Wood in the pit uh, during a pit stop here, but then Rahal jumped past his own teammate, Al Jr., in the second set of pit stops. So, thumbs up to the uh, Gallus Greco crew and Bobby Rahal's team. Well, we see Carl Haas there. He's the center of another one of the big conversations, rumor, if you will, about this weekend. I haven't had a chance to talk to him about it. But the Cosworth engine, their new engine, which they say is hopefully the same level of development ahead of the Chevrolet as the Chevrolet was ahead of the Cosworth when it came out, is ready. They've been running it on the dyno for some time. They're ready to give it to a team. Some people say this man, Carl Haas, will be the team that will have that new Cosworth engine. Cosworth also hopes to have it in a car before this season is out. In fact, expects to. That's right. That is a fairly hot rumor making the rounds at the moment. Now, this Cosworth engine, in fact, was supposed to have been ready last year. Cosworth were here at most of the races, tagging their engine. There were no takers. No takers for the engine. But since then, they've done some more development on it. And I think they may have convinced Carl Haas that it's worth an opportunity, it's worth a chance. It may be more powerful than the Chevrolet, and of course that is what Carl Haas is banking on. That's why he'd make the change. Ray Hall and Al Unser Jr. in this circulating battle for third place just got around Jeff Andretti. Eddie Cheever is sitting back there, but he is two laps behind the race right now, and so he is not part of this battle. Cheever runs in 10th place and continues his fight, by the way, trying to get up and catch Scott Pruitt. And John Andretti, speaking of the family, well, a problem there as he pulls off the course. He was running in ninth place just prior to this, but whatever it was, he recognized that it was something serious and got the car off right away. This race started with two full rows under the name Andretti. One of them, John, winner of the first race of the year. Well, there's something unusual we've seen this year. You don't often see that Pennzoil car stop. John Andretti really has a great season so far. What a way to start off a new team relationship with a new driver with a win like he had in Australia. But we can't see what's wrong. No smoke. May not be the engine. Could be something in the transmission. Jim Hall, one of the car owners, and his son, and uh, Franz Weiss representing Count Rudy von der Straten. Good effort this year. Michael Andretti. Continues to set a record pace, 114 miles an hour. An update now, Gary Gerald. Well, the story for John Andretti, gearbox. So many times you hear that on road courses. Jim Hall and the team obviously greatly disappointed. They were running in the top 10. They've been up there in points. Sometimes you can soldier on with gearbox problems, but he said, we lost it all. Third, fourth, fifth gears, it's just no chance. So the afternoon is over for John Andretti. Oh, that's too bad. And that's a part that, given that car in today's world, the gearbox really on that machine, not developmental, it ought to be pretty bulletproof. Well, it really should be. I mean, we've seen the uh, the latest electronic gearboxes in Formula One. I hope they don't make their way to IndyCar racing because of the enormous expense. But a gearbox is not something that breaks on a regular basis these days in IndyCars. Rick Mears continues his fight with Al Unser Jr. We're at the 76th lap. After 75 laps, Michael Andretti, still an awesome power in this race, looking for a victory. And we'll be back with more. Budweiser G.I. Joe's 200. 77 laps are now complete. There's the leaderboard. Michael Andretti, that name has not been replaced at the top of the order. This man, Emerson Fittipaldi, car number five, continues to try and catch Michael, but he runs a full eight seconds back. John Andretti, you saw him just fall out. Now he's with Gary Gerald. 
And again, disappointment, but there's still a smile on the face of John Andretti. When that gearbox goes away, you don't have any options left. Uh, what are the conditions like out there for those guys who are still trying to win this race as well? Well, really, this race isn't um, that hard on, on gearboxes. I, um, I think Detroit would be a lot harder, but for some reason, um, we broke third gear right after the second pit stop, and um, I decided to run fourth, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and um, then fourth broke, so I decided to run fifth and sixth, and then fifth broke. So um, I went away for, to just run sixth. There wasn't anything there, so um, I think what happens is one gear explodes, and the next one goes, and then, so um, we'll just have to go back and... Um, and see if we can do it again. And the next test is at Cleveland, and that's a tough place on gearboxes, too. We'll see John Andretti there. Let's go back now. I think Jan Bikas is standing by at the other end of pit road. Thanks, Gary. During all these pit stops when they're rolling tires around all over the place, you wonder how they keep track of what tires go on the car. They have a neat way, and leave it to IndyCar Racing to figure out. You fill in the L of Goodyear Eagle for a left tire, then you go down over here and fill in the second one. This means set number two. Now, in cart, they limit you to seven sets of tires a weekend, maybe so you won't run out of letters. Paul? <laughs> Well, John Andretti out of the race, but he keeps a smile. Here comes Guido Daco back after a stop, running a little bit late. Michael Andretti, well, Emerson Fittipaldi's closing in just a bit as they both work in traffic right now. Bobby Rahal runs in third place, and Al Unser Jr. still trying to battle both with Rick Mears and catch Bobby Rahal at the same time. But here's the leader, and look at him fight this car. Let's go inside Michael Andretti's car because I want you just to see the amount of corrections he has to make while he leads this race. Goes up through the gearbox, reads his pit board, now he's in top gear. And just watch his gear changes, just watch how aggressive he is going in through this chicane. Two gear changes. Bang, over the curb. He'll change down here. No, he stays. This is a six-speed gearbox. Same gear all the way through. Now he'll make one downshift up here. There it is. See how fast it is. Inside, watch the traffic. No gear shift. Now watch the curve. Lucky. One apex. Two apexes. Changes gear. Another apex. Boom. Right there. Up through the gearbox and away. It's su such a high level of concentration to hit all those apex points all the time. And... Uh, lap cars, look at the curb here, right up over the top of the curb. One of the few curbs in Portland you can use, but a lot of concentration and a lot of hard work. From the Quaker State onboard camera, one of the masters, Michael Andretti, who dominates this race here in the Budweiser G.I. Joe's 200. We'll be back with more from Portland International. The Quaker State onboard camera, he runs in seventh place. Mario Andretti is the combat that he's trying to fight. And boy, look at me, you hear him hit the brakes? As he fights with A.J. Foyt, he chalked those brakes hard to get into that corner. Whoa, whoa, and in open wheel race cars, if those wheels get interlocked, the car that's trying to make the pass goes straight up into the air. We saw how close Lionox front wheel got to A.J. Foyt's rear. Ari probably just now starts to breathe. Look how bumpy it is. That's Michael Andretti as he tries to move up. He's just behind Lion Dyke right now. And Michael has been playing very carefully. After we watch that lap with Michael, he's short shifting. I think he is short shifting. We expected a lot more gear changes in through that infield section, but look at him now, all over Lion Dyke. Now, when you look from outside the car, these do not move around as much, but just look at the movement on Michael's car and how bumpy the car is. Look on Ari's car, how much roll rate you're seeing in the corner, though. That seems to be almost excessive. What do you think? That's right. This is under braking here. Look at oh, Michael. Look at that. Right up, right over the curve and the inside curve. Use everything that's there. Michael comes in. He's right at the back end of Ari Leyendijk's car right now. Not a battle for position, but still critical. Now you're on board, Michael, as he tucks in just behind Ari in the number nine Granatelli machine. At the same time this is happening, Fittipaldi in the last three laps has gone from eight seconds up to seven. Now he's back to eight. But this is how Fittipaldi, if he is going to, can in fact close the distance. Fittipaldi running alone. They come under Guido Daco. Again, the Quaker State on board camera. Great shots here to Michael Andretti. He goes from left to right to left, trying to find the way past line. Yeah, you see way. that? Oh, get yeah. out of my way. Come on, give me a break here. I'm leading the race. Get out of my road. Look, again, he does it. Now, does Ari see it? Nope, Ari comes right across the corner. He's got his own agenda. And a 
course, it's an important day for Ari. He has to demonstrate something so maybe he can get a major sponsor. So there's two very important values here. Well, the reason Michael waves, one is he's waving to the flag marshal saying, hey, give him the blue flag. But another thing, he hopes Lyadike sees him in his mirror waving at him. Yep. The blue flag, though, blue flag, yellow diagonal. They call it the passing flag. It is not an order. As here comes Fittipaldi. There you see the distance. As Fittipaldi moves around Mashusta, that is not a flag that orders anything. You're right. It's not a flag that, that is a command. It just makes you aware there is somebody trying to pass you. But usually, there's a professional courtesy that if it's the leader, you do try and give him a little bit of room, let him get on his way. Jeff Wood being reported out of the race with an engine problem now. Michael Andretti has just completed his 86th lap, 104 laps, the scheduled distance here today before a giant crowd. Mike Neely, the promoter here, always does a marvelous job here at Portland International. This relatively young track is still, still growing and still creating some great racing. I think Michael trying to get traffic, trying to, through traffic, trying to lap people will definitely be one of the stories of this race. I'm sure his team are on the radio again trying to get Lionite to pull over. I'm surprised Ari, who knows he's not going to win this race, doesn't move over, but look at Emerson. Fittipaldi has a clear run now to try and catch up to Michael. We'll watch very carefully to see how the interval continues as Michael still tries to hold up Lyondike. Same situation you mentioned before between Michael and Scott Pruitt. Lyondike is driving his own race. Michael is a little bit faster, but not quite enough faster to get past. Let's go down to the pits and get an update from Gary Gerald. Checking in on the fortunes of Al Unser Jr. Remember, not feeling physically well, but just check with Rick Gallus, and he says, well, you know, Gary, he said that kid is tougher than an old boot. <laughs> a Western way to express the feelings, but certainly that sums up the disposition of Al Unser Jr. Soldiers away. He says, I wish we could gain some ground on Bobby Rahal, who's in third, and Vittipaldi, who's in second, but they're hanging in at this point. Both he and Rahal, they tell us, have fuel available if necessary, but they both say they're on that ragged edge, but they think they're okay to get to the checkered flag without running out of fuel. Well, running in fourth place, Little Al is about three seconds behind Ray Hall, but that interval continues at about that rate. In the meantime, the interval between Michael Andretti and Emerson Fittipaldi remains at about 8.5 seconds. Quaker State on board camera, Bobby Ray Hall, third place, looking for Fittipaldi just ahead. Fairly long look, though, at nearly half a lap ahead is Emerson Fittipaldi, the second place car. 88th lap now into the record books. You wonder why drivers chop over curves and drive over the top of them. What they're doing, they straighten the corner as much as they can. So we saw Ray Hall on a regular basis drive over the curves entering. Then he'll drive over the center curve. He'll make that line as straight as possible because a straight line is a lot faster than having to make the car go round left and right corners. So the situation here at Portland, Michael Andretti trying to get around Ari Leyendijk so he can pull away from Emerson Fittipaldi even further than he already is. Fittipaldi back about eight seconds. Don't forget Thursday here, top-ranked boxing, the USBA Bantamweight Championship. Eddie Cook and Johnny Vasquez at Valley's Las Vegas, live, 9 o'clock Eastern time here on ESPN. Now, Michael Andretti started this race by shouldering aside the entire front row, taking the lead in the very first maneuver going into the chicane. He's led ever since. We're coming to the closing moments of the race. Does he have enough fuel? Can he hold on? Can he be the first two-time winner this year? Andretti has been driving much of his laps with one hand on the wheel and the other raised, trying to get the attention of Ari Leyendijk just ahead because he's been caught up behind Ari Leyendijk. Michael Andretti, of course, the leader of the race, and Fittipaldi has trimmed two seconds off of Michael Andretti's lead in the past couple of moments. Let's go to Michael's pit now. Here's Jan Vikas. Well, according to Michael's pit, the reason that the, he cannot get by these cars is he has been forced to short shift. He is short shifting just like you guys were talking about when you're watching the in car. But he says they are so concerned about fuel that he doesn't want to take the chance and using all those revs to pass the other cars. Paul? Well, Fittipaldi closing in, as I mentioned, in the past three laps, closing two seconds. Now to 6.2 seconds behind Michael Andretti and closing in. So the question remains in Ari Leyendijk. Now he waves back at Michael and says, take the corner. You've got it. There it is. Well, Carl Hasco 
going to be a little happier now as he continues. There's Jason Fittipaldi. That's Emerson's son. So Fittipaldi now just a tick under six seconds back. The question remains, does Michael Andretti for these remaining laps with 92 complete, 12 to go, does he have to continue to short ship? Does Fittipaldi have more fuel available to him? If he has more fuel, then Fittipaldi can continue to run flat out. And maybe he could catch Michael, maybe even pass him. Of course, we saw Carl Haas there compute all the figures. What he does is he doesn't monitor Michael's car. He monitors Emerson's car. If Emerson is to make a charge and catch Michael, then they may be forced to step up the pace. But if he can keep this gap at about four or five seconds and control the race, Michael does not need to use any more revs. Michael Andretti ducks inside Mike Groff, who had the front end of the car wash out a little bit, going on to the pit straight, and there's Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi has picked up another tenth of a second. He's now 5.8 back. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. Just checking in with Chuck Sprague, Rick Reinemann, and the team that is uh, on the radio with Emerson Fittipaldi. We ask, have you been able to give him anything back? Meaning, can you get more revs? Can you get uh, anything back? Riching it up? They said, no, not at this point. We can't. It's so close, but we still think we're okay. We can get there. We asked him if they had fuel, if they did have to come to the pits. He says, it's only a splash. It may only be a half gallon left in the big fuel tank, Paul. Well, so some fuel in both of those fuel tanks. But do they carry on board enough to make it? The reason there's a fuel question here is the regulation states you have enough fuel to win the race if your car can do at least 1.8 miles to the gallon. That's the figure they're working to. If your car cannot do 1.8 miles to the gallon, you will run out of fuel. And of course, the reason for limiting fuel goes hand in hand with the pop-off valve on the engine. They are trying to equate these cars. And with a pop-off valve, they regulate the airflow into the engine. And by limiting the total fuel available, they regulate the fuel. And thereby, to some degree, regulate the power and try to keep these cars more and more equal. Now, 19 miles to go, 10 laps. Rick Mears continues to run in fifth place, trying to catch Al Unser Jr. Rick Mears very much regarded as the overmaster, but really is extremely fast on road circuits. And he is one of these unique drivers that uses his left foot on the brakes instead of his right foot. Normal road race drivers use a right foot on the brake, heel, toe on the throttle with the side of your foot, and only use the left foot for the clutch. Mears drives road courses just like he drives the ovals. Never uses the clutch on the upshifts, and in fact, he doesn't even use the clutch on his downshifts. He's able to have the timing just right to blip the throttle as he goes up gears and blip it as he comes down. Left foot is only used for the brakes. A unique situation that Mears is very, very good at. Rick Mears fights the back end a little bit there. Michael Andretti out in front, and out in front by only three and a half seconds. We'll be back with more. Raceway. Michael Andretti is out in front of Emerson Fittipaldi, but the gap is narrowing down to just under four seconds. Chris Mears continues to communicate with her husband, Rick Mears, who runs in fifth. And here is Fittipaldi now in the same situation that Michael Andretti found himself just a few moments ago. He is behind Ari Leyendijk. Ari now should be well aware, with the leader coming past, that second place can't be far behind. How will Ari Leyendijk react to this? Remember again, Ari Leyendijk looking for some major sponsorship here today. In fact, if he doesn't get it, well, then next week there will be no effort by Ari Leyendijk. And don't forget, coming up next Sunday, more IMSA GTP competition with the Camel Continental. You're going to be there. I'll be there. Watkins Glen, New York. Live coverage begins at 1 o'clock Eastern here on ESPN. Leyendijk continues using all of the course that he can. And Fittipaldi driving very neatly. You notice Fittipaldi's not climbing the curves nearly as much. Now on the pit straight, he closes in on Leyendijk, trying to get past before time runs out. 98 laps into the record book. 104 laps of scheduled distance, and Emerson's passed him. So Emerson now has a clear shot, but that little maneuver cost him almost three seconds. Emerson is now about six seconds now back. There's exactly what they have to do. Now they have to catch him. There's no obstacle at the moment. But can they catch him? Well, if anybody can, Fittipaldi may be able to get it done. That little breather that Michael just got when Emerson was caught a little bit there, lost a couple of seconds, that might be the critical factor that will decide this race. Because Michael now gained 
time, does not have to push this car anymore, does not have to use any more fuel. Now Michael Andretti with his father just ahead of him, so he's got a little bit of help if he has to pass that next car. Fittipaldi has one more car to handle, but Fittipaldi now can see Michael. Michael is just ahead. So Fittipaldi now has an actual visible object. It's no, no, no longer a number on a pit board or a radio communication. And now there is no one in between Fittipaldi and Michael. There's Brian Lyles, that's Michael's engineer, looking at the computer, trying to uh, understand the information they give you, trying to see, is Michael gonna be okay? Remember, of all people, Michael has run out of fuel, I think, more than anybody else in the last couple of seasons. They do look worried. They're doing a lot of figuring in that Michael and Ready pit. Well, they're figuring down at the Penske group, too, as Michael now, let's watch the shifts again and see how he's shifting because he's now using a little bit more of the racetrack. Keep an eye on it, Derek. The thing about when you short shift, you have to try and make up the speed in the corner. That's why we see Michael still driving over the top of the curve, using everything he can in the corner, trying to maintain that momentum. But look at Fittipaldi. He is getting ever closer. Remember, the closest finish in IndyCar history happened right here on this straightaway at Portland. Chuck Sprague checking the numbers. They check it down in the Numa Haas pits. Is there enough fuel? Will we have to bring the car in? Certainly, if they do, they don't want to telegraph anything. Because if you're Michael Andretti running in the lead as he is right now in the Quaker State onboard camera, you're hoping that these guys, the Penske organization, may have fuel problems too. Maybe you end up going into the pits together. Well, Gary Gerald may have an update on Emerson Fittipaldi's fuel status. Well, it plays out, of course, right to the bitter end, Paul, and it gets more intriguing by the moment. But the Penske team showing confidence. I don't know how much of a gamble it is, but they've given him a little bit more. They're cranking up that boost or tweaking up the enriching the fuel, giving him the revs. And so Emerson is really in the chase now, but only a couple, what, three laps to go or inside three. I would say at this point, with now three laps to go, that if I were in the Penske group, I'd just take the chance, give him the order to go. What do you think? When you race for someone like Roger Penske, winning is everything, second is nothing. But remember, Emerson is still in a fight for the championship. So winning the race, you know, the, the, the difficulty is how much do you gamble? How much do you take that gamble and try and get that race win? All right, situation two. The Penske organization, there is telemetry. This is a laptop computer. You see them all up and down the pits now. And they do their fuel calculations in here, and part of it is based on what the driver reports from his instrument cluster every lap. He'll tell how much has gone through his flow gauge, and then they'll calculate and recalculate and, and extend it to the end of the race in the computer. Can he make it to the end of the race? And of course, every time they stop in the pits, they know exactly how much fuel went into the fuel tank, so then they can go back and make sure their calculations are in fact correct. Fittipaldi tries to close, but can't. Now, two laps to go. And boy, they are still trying to figure it out as they put the calculations in their chart. Also, a lot of record keeping going on there. A lot of that writing is just that. How fast did he go? What were the problems? But let's not forget, two years ago, Milwaukee, this driver had it all wrapped up to the very last lap. That's quickly approaching. Will Michael Andretti be able to make it to the finish of this race? Fuel, always a question here. That's Mario Andretti that is just in front of Michael. So Michael's going to get a little help from Dad if he has anything to try to encounter up here. He makes it through that sweeping final turn onto the pit straight. And this time around, he should see Nick Fanoro's white flag as he comes down the line. One hundred and three laps are complete for Michael Andretti. If Fittipaldi is going to have a chance, this is it. Just under two miles to go for Michael. Is there enough fuel? Here comes Fittipaldi, his final pass completely down the pit straight. He's through the chicane. Michael now works up through three and four. Michael Andretti, his father line just ahead with less than a lap to go now. Well, there's no way Emerson would catch him now with speed, so the only hope for him is that Michael runs dry. Everything sounds good now, but Michael will listen for every rev and make sure there's no... <coughs> That spells disaster. Fittipaldi came across the line 4.6 seconds behind Michael. There's Mario Andretti on board with Michael now. Let's watch and listen on this, the final lap. Sounds good, looks good. It was at this corner some years ago 
that Michael failed and lost the race. It's not going to happen today. Michael Andretti flashes under the checkered flags and becomes the first man this season to win two races. Michael Andretti is the winner of the Budweiser G.I. Joe 200. Emerson Fittipaldi comes across the line in second. Bobby Rahal will approach the line in third place, and Michael Andretti does it at 115.2 miles an hour, a new track record by a full five miles an hour. Here comes Rahal. Al Unser is behind him, and Rahal trying to pick up some more points. Rahal finishes in third place as the checkers fly over his head. So Michael Andretti, there he is. He's the winner in a race that had to be nerve-wracking for Michael and the crew. Waved to the crowd. He waved to the flagman earlier on. He waved to Lionock earlier on. He waved to Pruitt. He waved to everybody today. Well, Bobby Rahal, with Michael's victory, increased the race, the points. And look at this. Rick Mears out of fuel over on the main straightaway. Rick Mears. Will he make it to the line? No. It's done. That shows you how close it really was. Now there's the gamble we spoke about earlier on. How much do you push it? We knew that Penske's allowed them to have a little bit of more fuel. Maybe Rick just used, well, we know he did. What, 100 yards too much fuel? Yep, just barely made it. But Michael, well, the engine still sings. There's plenty of fuel there. Michael comes down the straightaway, raving to the crowd. And in just a moment, we're going to be able to talk to him too as Michael Andretti wins the Budweiser G.I. Joe's 200. He's going to be a very happy man, I think, as Michael brings the uh, Kmart car to a stop, very casually pulls off the steering wheel, unstraps himself. Gary Gerald's right there. Indeed we are. Michael Andretti comes popping up out of there. He was able to go through this drill at Milwaukee to get his first win. A string of different winners has come to an end on the CART PPG IndyCar circuit. And the most delighted guy is the guy that we're getting the chance to talk to right now. Michael Andretti. Fuel, a big concern. How concerned were you? Because your crew was pretty nervous. Well, we were staying on the numbers all day, so I wasn't majorly concerned. And, uh, you know, I could tell that the other guys were having the same problem, so... Uh, you know, I, I didn't feel too bad. Like we said before, you know, the, the car was working so good that I was able to uh, conserve a little bit more. So it was great. We understand that your dad just ran out of fuel on this last lap on the back stretch. So it's been tough and close for everybody. Yeah, it was. But uh, as you can see, we had a couple gallons left. So uh, we were in good shape. We're peeking down in here and we see a 38.1. That would indicate there's 1.9 left in the tank. That's right. Uh, all right. Quick, quick math down here. Let's talk a little bit about the start of this race from the second row. And there was obviously, according to our replay, some contact, a brush there as you shouldered your way into the lead. Uh, no, I didn't touch anybody. I didn't touch anybody going into that, that corner. Nope, no contact from your standpoint at all? Not at all. How, how much of a risk did you think you were taking going into that chicane? Well, you, you know you're, you're going to take a little risk because here it's very hard to pass, so it's very important to get a good start. And when I saw Emmo go to the inside to protect himself, I just decided to go to the outside and... Uh, uh, you know, it worked out all right. I didn't feel like it was too bad because you can trust guys like Emerson at this start. Now, in other points in the race, trying to get through traffic, Scott Pruitt first, then Ari Leyendijk. How frustrated and how angry were you then? <laughs> Very angry. If we wouldn't have won this race, I would have had a, you know, a long talk with them, uh, especially Pruitt. Uh, you know, he was definitely in my way. I mean, I had to basically hit him to get out of the way, to get him out of the way. Well, last year, Michael Andretti got on the backup car after similar problems in qualifying in mid-Ohio. He won. He's won here at Portland. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. Feels great. All right, let's go to Jan Bikas. I'm with Rick Mears, and unfortunately, we are a couple football fields away from the finish line. You almost made it there, Rick. Yeah, close. Just not close enough. We knew it was going to be a, a mileage race, and... Uh, you know, we had it figured close, but uh, a little too close. Trying to chase Al there at the end. Uh, I, I use a little more RPM stuff than I should have, I think, trying to get him for the position after losing it in the pit stop. So, um, you know, it's just one of those days. But the points race is so close this year, it's just got to really make it make it tough. Well, it does. You know, it's you know, like I've said, you're going to have to scratch for every point this year. It's a very, one of the most competitive years I've ever seen in IndyCar racing. So uh, uh, this hurts a little bit, but uh, we can turn around to the next one shows what kind of professional you are. I mean, you're still smiling. You waved to the crowd when you got out of the car, and uh, we wish you best of luck next time. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, it cost Rick Mears one position and two critical points in the fight. Emerson Fittipaldi finished second. There's much, much more to come here from Portland International. We'll be right back.
How to live. Part of family Fittipaldi here in Portland. This is Tatiana, the daughter of Emerson, and of course Teresa is expecting a, a baby. We saw Jason earlier. Emerson, uh, congratulations. I know you wanted to repeat and follow up Detroit with a win. Second place today, a tough chase against Michael all day long. Well, Gary was, uh, Michael was running beautiful. I mean, uh, I had no problem whatsoever. I was a little slow through traffic. I had a possible little too much drag on the street. I couldn't pass people. Uh, I had difficult. That's where Michael opened the gap, but you know, Michael did a beautiful race, and uh, I was there, right there, four seconds at the end of the race, and trying very hard to catch him. How tough is it to drive when you know you've got to conserve fuel, and maybe you can't push it just as hard as you'd like to? Well, mid-race, uh, I have to say fuel. I, I, I was using less revs, I was running the engine leaner, but the last segment of the race, uh, when it was like 15 laps to go, Chuck called on the radio and said, now you can use more fuel and then try, and that's when I was lapping quicker and quicker. Emerson, we hear that uh, you're putting together a race for Indy cars down in your home country of Brazil. Can you tell us anything about that? Well, we're all very excited. I think it's going to happen in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, they'll build a, a short oval where used to be the Brazilian Grand Prix on the uh, Jacarepaguá racing circuit. It could be very, very exciting. Well, we're all looking for. I think it'll be a great race. Uh, you know, it'll be great for Brazil to have IndyCar race there. All right. Head for the podium, my friend. <laughs> Thank Emerson Fittipaldi, second place finisher as we go back to Paul Page. Fittipaldi got uh, approval for that event just last week, hopes to bring it up in perhaps 1992. This is the start once again, Derek Daly. And boy, watch Michael, car number two. What a traffic jam. He said he didn't hit Rick. Well, if he didn't, it's because Rick saw an accident about to happen. Because watch Rick right there, pull away from Michael. Knew there would be contact. Maybe there wasn't, but a very daring and decisive and probably you know, the type of aggressive move you see from somebody who's so much on top of his game, which Michael Andretti is at the moment. Most significant moment in the race as Michael takes the lead, the lead all, 104 laps. Let's go to Jan Vikas. Mario Andretti with the fifth place finish. Mario, you guys are getting used to filling up the podium with Andretti. As today, Michael took it, but a fifth place for you. Well, it's, uh, you know, congratulations to him. I'm really happy for him. Um, we tried something different to try to get this thing going better, and uh, uh, we just lost the balance, uh, you know, on right-hand corners. But other than that, you know, it's, you know, the car stayed at least stayed the same, but uh, uh, it was not as good as it could have been. You look a bit tired. Sometimes that means it was loose. Were you out there fighting the car? Well, uh, carried it a little bit, you know. Uh, so it was not not an easy race by any means. Okay, Mario Andretti always pushing as hard as he can with what he has. So for Michael Andretti, and by the way, Chevrolet, 26 straight wins. Well, we'll have a great deal more from here at Portland International. We'll take a look at the point standing, how this race affected that when we come back. Back at the start of the race at Portland International Raceway, from Michael Andretti's point of view, the decisive moment as they rolled around toward the green flag. Emerson Fittipaldi to the right, Rick Mears to the left. Michael with one car to his inside, and then a very brave and daring move, a move that made the difference here today. And there's the gap he wants to go for, to the left side of Emerson. But Rick is there, he forces the issue, but now Emerson gets on the brakes a little bit early. Michael takes the opportunity, bang over the curb. Little correction, another correction right there. Look at that oversteer correction. What a decisive starting maneuver. So, the final standings, uh, provisional at the moment. Michael Andretti, Emerson Fittipaldi, Bobby Rahal, Al Unser Jr., despite his illness here today. Mario Andretti, who stopped on the last lap, as did Rick Mears, and lost the position to Mario. Ari Leyendijk, we look down now through the entire field in the final standings here today. Cars out, John Andretti, Jeff Wood, Danny Sullivan, Didier Tays, and Dale Coyne, the only cars that fell out of this race. So the race has been run, points have changed, but not the leader of the points. At the top of the order, it's Bobby Rahal, who increased his points lead by another four points. He now has 90. Still chased by Rick Mears. Michael Andretti takes a jump, though, moving up to third place with 74 points. Ari Leyendijk, well, there's a question. Does he continue to run now? Bobby Rahal, Rick Mears, and Michael Andretti, Emerson Fittipaldi as we take a look down the order. 
Let's go back down to Gary Gerald. And on pit road, Paul, Scott Pruitt is here. And you were showing the video of that traffic jam in the start of the race. Well, here's a guy who was right in the middle of it in the second row. It was wild going to that chicane. It was real wild. It was trying to um, put about four or five cars into about a one-car place. And it was uh, it was almost touch and go. Fortunately, nobody touched anybody. Um, we used the curbs and uh, every bit of the track that was out there. But, uh, you know, the Budweiser car ran well today. Unfortunately, not quite, you know, well enough considering how we started. And, We'll see how he goes at Cleveland. Let's go to the driver's meeting. Now, I wasn't there today. Jan got in there. Did they talk about the start of this race and what could happen in that chicane in the driver's meeting? Well, they always do. You know, Portland, it's always it's tough going down in there in the chicane. And, you know, they said, you know, try and be aware of each other and, you know, be careful. And, you know, let's let's get this race started and have all the all the starters going instead of piling up down there in turn one. And it, it came off it came off pretty well. In fact, the whole race. Um, it went very, very well today. Well, I know Scott's real happy to finish this race, uh, Paul. Let's uh, check in once again with our colleague, Jan Bikas. Well, I'm with Bobby Rahal, and Bobby, you've uh, certainly got these top three positions locked down. It sure helps you in the championship, though. Well, it does do that. Um, this wasn't quite quick enough, but I had unbelievable pit work. I, you know, I have to say, I think I only passed one guy, and that was Pruitt, and, and my crew, uh, they got me in and out of the pits beautifully, and the uh, last stop, we got ahead of Rick and Al that way, and luckily, we were able to stretch the, uh, our lead over them, but... Uh, you know, we weren't quite fast enough to win, but uh, I guess so, you know, we'll have to take third in that case. But uh, as you say, we got more more valuable points and stretched our lead a little bit on some people in the championship, so. Yeah, but you made it to the line, and Rick uh, was unfortunately a couple hundred yards short. Well, that's what I hear, and, and that gives me more points, you know, because Rick finishes a lot of races, and you need that. But uh, as I say, we still got to win some races, but there's a lot left. Well, Bobby Rahal is racking up the points. Paul? Are we talking maybe about a third championship at the end of this season for Bobby Ray Hall? Well, for the moment, the man in the spotlight is Michael Andretti. We'll be back to wrap it up right after this. Well, it's been a big day of racing here at Portland. This crew, though, by the way, was saddened to hear of the death of Benny Parsons' wife, Connie, a week ago today. And we certainly send our colleague and friend our sympathies. Well, Michael Andretti picks up the win. Second win of the season for Michael, the first man this year to do it, as he is acknowledged for that accomplishment on the podium here at the Budweiser G.I. Joe 200. Another great race here at Portland. Record crowd once again. Michael Andretti is the winner. Bobby Rahal is still out in front in the points, but Michael takes a whale of a jump. So now it's two weeks until the next race in the series, right here on ESPN at Cleveland, the Burke Lakefront Airport. With another change in the track, they'll run it just like they did last year with a spectacular first turn. I'm Paul Page for all of us here, Derek Daly, Jan Bikas, and Gary Gerald. We thank you so much for spending the time with us here today and continue to watch the PPG series on ESPN. <laughs>